your Bibles, if you want, if you would, to Matthew chapter 14. Mitch, I do like that million dollar view. I'd like us to take a minute and do something first. I met a guy here a few weeks ago, and it's it just an amazing thing how the Lord has you cross paths with people. And he's a, a pastor of a church in Kansas City. And just, just one thing led to another. And uh, it, was, it was just absolutely through a divine appointment of the Holy Spirit, and then the Holy Spirit speaking through me to this man, and secrets in his heart being laid open and then he began to tell me what was going on in his life and uh, he needs prayer today because he pastors a small church and he works a job to help support himself and uh, he's lost his job and he texted me and he said pray the Lord will, will uh, uh, help me with a job and I said consider it done the prayer and the provision Amen. Amen. So, Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus, and we unite faith today, Lord, in this prayer. And we say, Lord, have an employer call yes. David this very day. Yes. And, Lord, I pray, God, that he not just have yes. one job that he has to take, but that he has choices, Lord, that he can make a choice for, Lord, that is best suitable for him. Yes. And Lord, we say it's done in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 14. This is a familiar story. But I'm going to relate. I'm getting some ringing. Matthew chapter, I'm going to relate a few things that uh, I think are a little bit different. We're going to start with verse 22, and we're going to come in, uh, I want to explain just a little bit of background. Everybody knows the story of how Jesus had just finished feeding the crowd. They didn't have any food, and, and uh, the disciples wanted to send the people all the way so they could go find something to eat. And Jesus said, well, you feed them. And so they fed them with just, you know, a few loaves and fishes, and uh, then we come in on verse 22. And it says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side, while he sent the crowds away. And after he had sent the crowds away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray, and when it was evening, he was there alone. But the boat was already a long distance from the land, battered by the waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Now, first off, I want to, I just want to bring out a couple of things here on, in uh, verse 22. It says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead on the other side. Jesus gave the disciples a command. Now, these were guys who knew how to row a boat. You know, Peter and James and John were in the, the fishing business. And the other guys were raised around the lake, and they knew what was going on. They knew how to get in a boat and go to the other side. But it says that as they began to go, and Jesus is up on the mountain praying, he looks out and he sees them out there. They haven't made it to the other side. And the Bible says there that the wind had become contrary. And as Jesus sees this, it says he came walking to them on the water. And it says that, that it was the fourth watch of the night that he came to them walking on the sea. Now, the fourth watch of the night is somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. There's four watches in the night. And they're split up into three hours. 
And so he's coming in the last watch. He's coming in the fourth watch sometime. And he has sent them ahead and he's given them a command and he said, this is what I want you to do. Just go to the other side. And so they're out on the lake and the wind has become contrary and the waves are starting to beat around the ship and around the boat. And they're out there, they're rowing the boat and they're pulling on it. And you say, well, that was probably a sailboat. This is my story. <laughs> when you tell it, you can tell it your way. But if there's nothing specific, I'll put in what I want to put in, okay? I think they were rowing the boat. Now, when I was a kid, my dad and I used to fish the Missouri River. And mostly what we would do is we would fish with uh, bank lines and throw lines. But he also had a commercial license, and I had one too, And because he, he had trammel nets. Anybody know, everybody know what a trammel net is? Anybody know? Trammel net is a net of, you know, whatever length. But ours was 100 yards long, and then he had another 30-yard piece. Wow. And what you do with this net is you get into water about four or five feet deep, and it has to be still water. And you set it up through there adjacent to the bank. See, the bank's running that way, and you're out in the water a little way. And what you would catch in that were scaled fish. Now, if you ever caught a catfish in that thing, that was one dumb catfish. <laughs> because catfish, you can't catch in a trammel net. Because they would, what they would do is they'd come up to it and they'd sense it, and a catfish would back away. But what a carp would do is he'd come up there and he'd sense it, and I'm going through it. And he'd start through there, and what a, what a trammel net is, is it's got a big net on one side and a big net on the other side and a small net in the middle. And what he would do is he would start and he would take a run through that net and he'd get as far as he could because he couldn't break through it and he would turn and come back. And what he did was he made a sack and he would tangle himself in that sack that he couldn't get out of. And all you had to do was go back out there and pick that net up, take him out of that sack and you caught him. Well, when I fished with my dad, the water wasn't quite still where we set that. There was a little bit of current coming. And I'd have to get on the net, or I'd get on the oars, and I'd row that boat. And there was a little bit of a current. Plus, you could not let that boat roll over that net. Especially with my dad in the front of the boat running that net. Okay, You had to be Johnny on the spot with those oars. And I got so tired of rowing that boat. I got so tired of rowing that boat. And I can imagine these guys, they have been rowing this boat in a contrary wind against the waves for the first three watches of the night. And they've got to be getting tired. Their legs have got to be tired. Their backs have got to be tired. Their arms have got to be tired. They've got to be almost shot. And the Bible says that in the last part of the night, that Jesus comes to them walking on the water. Now, it's dark. And I think, how did they see Jesus walking out there on the water? Now, and this is a stormy night. Now, it's not raining, I don't think, because the Bible doesn't say it's raining. But it says that there's a bad wind blowing at the, and the waves are, are coming up, you know. And they see Jesus coming. I think Jesus was walking out there with a lamp in his hand. Huh? It makes sense to me because I, now, this is me, but I don't think Jesus wanted to trip over a wave that was coming up, okay? I, he wanted to see those waves as he was walking on top of them, all right? This is my story. This is my song. <laughs> and I think that Jesus, as he's coming to them, they see him from a ways off. I think they're rowing and he's coming, he's coming this way. They're rowing that way, and so they're looking this way. And they see this light coming. And they're running. And they start saying, hey, what is that light over there? What is it? And they say, well, well, I don't know. Did you keep rowing? Keep rowing. And they keep rowing. And this light gets closer and closer. And all of a sudden, they see a figure with that light. And the Bible says they think it's a ghost. And it says they became frightened 
So much so that they begin to scream like sissy girls. And Jesus gets close enough and he says, Shut up, you guys, it's just me. And they said, Oh. And Peter says, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come out there to you. Let's read a little bit more. Immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said to him, Okay, Peter, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stand up, take a hold of the rail of the boat, and I want you to put one foot over the side and... Make sure that you're not going to sink before you step out there. And then you bring your other leg over the rail. That's not what he said. Jesus gave him one word. Jesus gave him one word. Peter said, Lord, if that's you, tell me to come out there to you. And Jesus said, come. That was it. He said, come. And Peter gets out of the boat, and to his astonishment, he's standing on the water. And I think Jesus is not just three or four feet away. I think he has still been coming toward the boat, and as soon as Peter heard his voice, he said, Lord, if that's really you, tell me to come out there. And I think Peter was probably as far from here to that door as Jesus was from the boat. I think he was that far away. And he stands through the light and he said, come on out. Come, Peter. Come. So Peter gets out and he walks out there and he gets all the way over there. You know, there's a, there's a picture. out. It's a, it's a painting. It's out right now. And I, I know why a lot of people like it. Because, and what it is, is it's supposed to be Peter looking up through the water and they see Jesus with his hand just, just below the water reaching for him. I don't think that happened. You did not. I don't think it did at all. Because it says next, yeah. he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But seeing the wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. I think that Peter closed quite a bit of the distance between himself and Jesus. I think he walked quite a ways over there. And I think just about the time he gets to Jesus, a big white cap comes up and slaps him upside the head. And Peter sees where he's at, and he sees where he has come, and he sees what he is doing, and he gets afraid. Yeah. He becomes afraid. And he begins to sink. And as he begins to sink, he cries out, Lord, save me. Let's look next. Immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and took hold of him. I think what happened was Peter got almost to Jesus. He got almost out to where Jesus told him to go, and he got afraid, and he began to sink. But as he was starting to sink, he said, Lord, save me. He cried out, and Jesus, it says, immediately grabbed his hand. He immediately grabbed his hand. I don't think Peter got knee deep. I don't think he got knee deep before Jesus grabbed his hand. And the reason I think he closed most of the distance is because it says immediately. Jesus, I think he was standing right before Jesus. He was with arm's reach. I think he was. Yes. Mm -hmm. He was that close to his goal. Now that's good preaching. He was that close to his goal. And when he took off, he went with only one word. Jesus did not tell him step by step, inch by inch, what he was supposed to do. 
A lot of people are sitting around waiting on a word from the Lord. And they're wanting a big, long word of explanation so they can see everything that's going to happen between where they are and where they're going to wind up. It's never going to happen that way. It's not going to happen that way. And the best thing to know is this. God hasn't just given us one word. He's given us a book full of it. And it's all telling us to go the same direction. We don't have, you know, I love, I love the gifts of the Spirit. I love the anointing. And this, this fellow I was telling you about, the Lord spoke to me through the gift of a prophetic word to speak to him and tell him what was in his heart. And I understand that, but I also know this. If I'm going to sit around and wait and wait and wait and wait on a word, then I'm going to sit and wait and wait and wait and wait. Why? Because the word has been given. It's been given. That's good. The word has been given. It's been given. Jesus gave Peter one word, mm -hmm. and Peter took off. Yeah. He took off on one word. Now, Jesus immediately stretched out his hand and took hold of him, and he said to him, You have little faith. Why did you doubt? Now, this is, this is part, of the, part of the crux of this message I want to get to. I have heard this preached over and over and over many times. Not by all men, but by a lot of men. And it has been taught to too many people in the kingdom of God. That when Jesus took hold of Peter, he rebuked him. Mm -hmm. He didn't rebuke Peter. I mean, come on. Peter just walked on the water. Anybody here done that lately? Take me with you next time, okay? I think Jesus said, Oh, ye of little faith, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? You were almost here. You were walking on the water. You were doing a miracle every step you took. And he said, oh, ye of little faith. And people think that Jesus was belittling Peter's faith. He wasn't. He was telling Peter something. He was telling him something. Now, I'm going to go around the horn here a little bit to get back to this, okay? Uh, look in your Bibles in Luke chapter 1. I just want to read scripture to you. It's a Christmas scripture. I mean, you know Christmas is almost here. You think, well, it, it's still warm outside. Well, not for long. It was 45 when we left home yesterday morning. Luke chapter 1, verse 30. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son in her old age, and she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. For with God, nothing will be impossible. We love that scripture. We love to quote that scripture. We love to hang our hat on that scripture. But we've got to be able to take that scripture out of the word. We've got to be able to pull that thing out of there and apply that to our living in this kingdom. Yeah, amen. It's not enough that the Bible says with God, all things are possible. Come on now. 
that isn't enough. It's not enough for me to know that Jesus Christ is able to save me. If it never becomes personal, if I never come into a relationship with Christ, right. it is worthless knowledge. That's right. The same way with this. There are all kinds of people walking up and down all kinds of streets across all kinds of cities in this nation and in the world today who believe that there is a God who is powerful. But if they do not know Jesus Christ personally, Amen. if they do not have a relationship with him, that is wasted knowledge. Amen. That's right. It's worthless. It's worthless. And when we come to the scripture, when we come to the scripture and he says, with God, all things are possible. Or he says it the other way also. He says, with God, nothing shall be impossible. With God, nothing shall be impossible. And we think, amen, amen. But there's more to it than that. There has to be more to it. Let's look at Mark chapter 9. back and forth between the story here and the one back in Matthew. Jesus has been up on the Mount of Transfiguration and he has been transfigured before the eyes of three of the disciples Peter, James, and John. And as they're coming back down off of the mountain Verse 14, Mark 9, 14. It says, when they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. Immediately, when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to them. And he asked them, what are you discussing with them? And to make a long story short, the man had brought his demon-possessed son to the disciples and wanted them to cure him and they couldn't do it they were unable to do it and finally the father comes over to Jesus and it says verse 22 it has often thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him but if you can do anything take pity on us and help us and Jesus said to him, if you can, if you can, my wife and I were discussing something the other day. I built a garage. I know, it's been out there probably 20, 25 years. And I've never had any heat in that garage other than I used to have an old wood stove in there and, and some space heaters. And I was talking the other day, you know, what? I'd like to put a furnace out there in that garage. But I said, I really don't want to put a propane one out there. But I, and I've never ran a gas line out there. Now, I built that garage, pretty much all of it. I do all the plumbing around my house. I've totally remodeled my house, everything else. And I said, I'm thinking about running a gas line out there. And my wife said, she said, do you think you know how? <laughs> And I said, I just give her that look. I said, who, who do you think you're talking to? Who do you think you're talking to? It's a good analogy. It's great. This guy says, Jesus, if you can, yeah. if you can, would you help us? And Jesus said, if I can, if I can, and that's exactly how he said it. If you go in and you study the original language, Jesus said, if I can, if I can, he said, what does he say next? 
He says, all things are possible to him who believes. We have now gone from all things, or with God, nothing shall be impossible. Jesus brings it down a step further here in this telling of the story, and he says, all things are possible to him who believes. Okay, so it's moving a little bit closer. But most people still have trouble wrapping their faith around this statement. Most people still have trouble wrapping their faith around this statement. Let's turn back to Matthew chapter 17. And we're going to look at this story from a different angle. Matthew 17, verse 14. When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill. And he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, you believing and un you believing and perverted generation. How long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. If there is a rebuke, it is to the crowd. Okay? Jesus isn't rebuking his disciples here. He does not rebuke his disciples. Somebody told me a long time ago, you never rebuke the righteous. That's exactly what heard. You never rebuke the righteous. And the Lord never did that. The only time I re read of him rebuking was he rebuked his, disi his disciples was the only one was Peter. And that was when Peter said things that the enemy wanted him to say. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. That was when he said it. But here, Jesus said, and he's not even issuing a rebuke. Now, I've, I've, I've gone into, and I, I even brought it with me so I could study it even more, what is in my, my Greek and stuff like that. And what I see in there is that Jesus is speaking, and he's not really speaking to the crowd, but he is speaking out loud about the crowd. And when he says, unbelieving and perverted generation, what he is saying there is those of you whom your faith has been removed from you. And he said, the faith that you have has been perverted into believing the wrong things. He's not saying, you bunch of perverts. <laughs> He's not saying, you bunch of faithless perverts. How long am I going to have to put up with you? How long do I have to be around here? Aren't you learning anything? Jesus is saying, through his compassion, he is saying, oh, how long? How long is it that I'm going to have to put up with this? How long before people's faith gets turned around? You know, Jesus, when he came, one of the things he said, you know, people say, well, you know, we need to winsomely win the lost. Well, I, you know, I understand that, okay? But the scripture says when John the Baptist came, he preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. When Jesus came out of the wilderness, he began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Not everything we have to preach is going to be easily received. It's just not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. Because in the end, the gospel does one of two things. It draws the repentant or it repels the unrepentant. 
That's just the way it is. And that's what it's made to do. And Jesus said, oh, he said, I did not come to send peace like you think I have. He said, I came to bring a sword. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He said, I came to send a fire and how I wish that fire were kindled already. Why? Because he's talking about a fire destruction? No. He's talking about a sword that would divide the very thoughts and intents of the heart and the fire that would come and it would kindle a fire in the hearts of men that would cause them to be like Christ. Amen. Our God is a consuming fire. And Jesus is simply longing. He is longing for the day when unbelief will be gone. Mm -hmm. When perversion of faith will be put away. And he says this, bring your boy to me. Now, this next scripture, this is a tough one also for us to swallow sometimes, if we're going to read it the way it's written. How many of us in here believe when Paul said, let everything be done decently and in order. I believe. Yeah, I do too. Yes. But here's what we need to understand. Decently and in order to us. It ain't necessarily decently and in order to God. On the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit of God came, and everything that He did that day was decently and in order according to Himself. And they were so decent and in order, all 120 of them, that the crowd stood and said, these people are drunk. Now, they didn't think they were drunk because they were speaking in tongues. Jerusalem was the melting pot of the world. There were people there, the scripture says, from every part of the world, and they were all hearing them speak in their own language. That was not something unusual. What was unusual was that there were people drunk by 9 o'clock in the morning. True. What do drunk people look like? They reel to and fro, they fall down, and they carry on. Now, for some reason, the Holy Spirit figured that's decent and in order. The Scripture is full of things. How many of you would have liked to have been Isaiah? <clears throat> Before you say yes... Remember, the Lord told Isaiah, he said, Isaiah, I want you to take the next three and a half years and I want you to run around with nothing on below the waist. How many of you just want to be anointed now? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Think about it. <laughs> <laughs> he told Ezekiel, Ezekiel, I want you to go out and I want you to lay on the ground. And he said, you lay on your right side the whole time. And he said, I want you to cook your bread over dung. So he said, and I just said, oh, Lord, I can't do that. He said, nothing unclean has ever passed my lips. And the Lord said, okay, you can use cow dung then. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Lord. <laughs> Jesus rebuked him. He didn't rebuke the demon. This sentence isn't structured that way. It says, and Jesus rebuked him, and the demon came out of him, and the boy was cured at once. Oh, now, wait a minute. You mean you're going to rebuke a demon-possessed person? Sometimes. Sometimes you rebuke the person that the demon is in, don't you, brother? Huh? Sometimes you do. Sometimes you have to in order to get control of the situation. And then it says, after he rebuked him, the demon came out of the boy and he was cured. At once. <laughs> I 
I get in trouble at my own church too, you know, so. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and they said, why could we not drive it out? Listen to what Jesus says. Because of the littleness of your faith, truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Mm -hmm. All right. You see, we all like the scripture that says, with God, nothing shall be impossible. And we also like the scripture that says, nothing shall be impossible to him who believes. But Jesus takes this all the way down to a personal level. He brings it down to me. He brings it down to to even Bill, insignificant me. And he says, if you have the faith, the size of a grain of mustard seed. How many of us in there have ever seen mustard seed? It's tiny. It is absolutely tiny. It's almost like when you when you Shake pepper out of a paper, or a paper, a pepper. I shouldn't be saying that, I don't think. When you shake pepper out of a shaker, that could get you in trouble, couldn't it? And you see the little flecks of black pepper. That's kind of what mustard seed looks like. It's that small. And Jesus is saying here, he's saying, he said, listen, you have little faith and your faith is little and he said if you have the faith the size of a mustard seed there is a place in the scriptures where the disciples said Lord increase our faith how many have ever, how many have ever prayed that come on be honest we have all prayed that and I looked this up the other day they said to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. And Jesus gave him this very statement. He said, if you have faith inside of a mustard seed, he said, you say to this tree, be picked up by the roots and thrown over there. And he said, it'll happen. How many of you know that in God there is no death? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He didn't say, I'm the death. Jesus conquered death. Everything God has is living. Can you agree with that? Amen. You know, we, we just finished that, what, studying on Wednesday nights the uh, book of Revelation. And I like one of the statements there toward the end. That it talks, you know, John's always recorded a voice came from the, out of the temple or a voice came from him. John says once, he says, I'm looking at God sitting on his throne and I hear a voice coming from the throne. It's not coming from God. It's not coming from Jesus. It's not coming from the elders. It's not coming from any animated person up there. It's coming from the throne. Even the inanimate objects that occupy the space around God himself are alive. He is so much full of life that even the things around him that we would consider to be dead have life in them. That's good. Yes. Amen. The scripture says that all things are held together yeah. by what? The word of his power. Now, for years in my head... That transposed from the word of his power to the power of his word when I read that. All things are held together by the power of his word. That ain't what it says. It says all things are held together by the word of his power. The word word there is not the word logos. 
It is the word rhema. Yeah. It is the word rhema. Yes. It is the it is the power of God's word, the very existence of his word, or the, the very existence of his power, that words just simply emanate from his power and they speak. That's good. Just because his power exists, words emanate from it. God gives us not faith. Listen, God can only give us things that belong to Him. When He gives us Holy Spirit, the Bible says, now the Lord is the Spirit. Mm -hmm. yeah. When God told Moses, He said, Moses, call the elders together because I'm going to take from the spirit that is on you. He didn't say, I'm going to take your spirit. He said, I'm going to take from the spirit who is on you and place him upon them. Well, that spirit is God himself. The life that we have now in us, having come to Christ, is God's life itself. That's why it's eternal. The faith, listen to me, even as small as it is, as tiny as it is, as, as a grain of mustard seed, is God's own faith that he places in us. He takes faith out of himself and he places it in us. And even that small of faith yeah. has got so much power yeah. that we will speak yes. to a mountain. And Jesus said, nothing shall be impossible with you. Not just nothing shall be impossible with God. Not just that all things will be possible to him who believes. Nothing will be impossible for you. Yes, amen. For me. Come on. Praise God. Nothing. That's why when Jesus said, He who believes, the works I do, mm -hmm. you do them too. Mm -hmm. You do them too. Now, the only part of this that was negative, Jesus just said to Peter, He said, Why did you doubt? Mm hmm. Remember why Peter doubted? He got afraid. He had almost accomplished walking all the way on the miraculous. And he got afraid. Yeah. And Jesus said, why did you doubt? Mm -hmm. It was because he became afraid. Mm -hmm. Doubt is the offspring of fear. And fear kills faith. Mm -hmm. Amen. Can't go with this. Fear kills faith. Yes, it does. And doubt is the offspring. Mm -hmm. That's good. But the faith he has put in us, nothing can stand before it. There is nothing impossible. Mm -hmm. Nothing is. And I like to take that statement like this. When Jesus says, nothing shall be impossible for you, Let's turn that around a bit. Nothing happening is impossible. If nothing happens, that's not possible, Jesus said. Mm -hmm. Not with the faith of a mustard seed. Mm -hmm. Because with God, nothing happening is an impossibility. When the Lord spoke to the confusion at, at creation, and he said, let there be light. I mean, it, it happened. It happened. Nothing didn't happen. Something happened. What happened was exactly what God said is going to happen. And we'll close with this scripture. Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. 
what is the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward in into and through those of us who believe that's what that means it doesn't just mean to us well you know that that's not enough it means toward us into us in us and through us and he says this is the same power that God exercised when he raised Christ from the dead that is the power that lives in us through that small small mustard seed size of faith amen father I praise you I praise you for your goodness my God, my God, my God. Hallelujah. Lord, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In us as it is in heaven. In me as it is in heaven, Lord. Oh, Lord. Thank you. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. All of us. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to your name, Lord. say you have faith and you have faith to see but I tell you what I have seen says the Lord is greater than your vision because I do not just see what you are focused on I see all and what I have planned for you is beyond your vision it is beyond just the miraculous of from one point to another because what I have cannot be imagined with your mind what I have will only be grasped as it comes to pass in your life That is especially for one person in here. It's for us all, but I believe the Lord spoke that, wants that to be spoken for one person in particular. Oh God. Oh God. I pray, let the full realization of your kingdom be in us. Let us be a generation let us be a generation that the world will look at and they will say of a truth God is in the midst of you and his name is Jesus hallelujah amen